Good evening. Easter evening. Yes, it's been different. Very, very different. But we are going to believe and count on the fact that we have a new reality and that we're going to move into that reality with Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, under God Almighty's control, and we're going to be fine. We may have to learn some things, that's for sure. Tonight, I want to share with you the new reality. The new reality. Now, I'm first thinking of the new reality Easter morning. Jesus is alive. And then I'm thinking new reality for you and me right now after this crisis event that we've been in. What will be our new reality? What should we be thinking and preparing and praying for? I want to read you a scripture that is, is from Hebrews, the sixth chapter, two verses, 19 and 20. It says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. In Christ, we have a hope in an anchor that is sure and it's steadfast. So, first of all, we need to claim right now that we have an anchor and his name is Jesus. And which entered into that within the veil. He has become our steadfast and sure anchor because he entered into the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, these are two very, uh, very good sayings or thoughts. The veil, V-E-I-L, and Melchizedek. I, I was thinking, as I was reading this in Hebrew, First of all, the veil. The veil was put by God himself into the tabernacle and then into the temple. And there was, of course, the Gentile court, the women's court, the men's court, where the priests could go, and then on into the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holy had a, a veil or a curtain, you and I might call it. It had a veil hanging down in front of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And this veil separated the human part of the tabernacle and where God came into the tabernacle. Not that he isn't everywhere, but he designed a place and I wrote a few things down to share with you. It was a 30 by 30, or it was 20 cubits by 20. And the measure of a man or an angel, as the Bible says, is usually estimated about a foot and a half. So 20 cubits by 20 cubits. And there was a, a blue, purple, crimson, scarlet. Those were the colors. In the fine linen veil. Did you catch that? Blue, purple, crimson, scarlet. Those were the the colors God chose. And the uh, this was a place where the ark was put. And uh, the ark had um, uh, a, a mercy seat up on it. And then there were angels or cherubims there that, that, that were pointed toward each other and their wings touched. But the Bible also says that there was angels standing in the room that, that, that had a five foot wing, wing span, five cubit wing span each. And that together they spanned the 20 cubits of that room. In addition to the mercy seat and those beautiful angels there on the mercy seat. And the Holy of Holies, even the high priest could only go in there once a year and offer for the sins that they had committed. And he would have to start by offering for his own sins because he was a human and he had lived a, a complete year 
since he had gone in and offered these particular offerings. So he would offer for himself, and then he would offer for the people. And, and, and that's what this scripture is talking about. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made him a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. When Christ died, that partition dividing people from the Holy of Holies was ripped from top to bottom. Christ, his flesh, his offering of his body and his blood, he has now become the veil. <laughs> he has now become that place where we can enter in without being veiled off from God. He has gotten us access that we can come into the throne room anytime, anywhere, from any place. Praise the Lord. You can pray in your bed. You can pray on the way to work. You can pray anywhere there is to pray. I've mentioned that several times today. I, I've known many people, uh, compared to what you might think, who got saved in a jailhouse or, or got saved right after a death of someone, who, who got saved in a crisis when they had done something terribly wrong, who got saved uh, in a crisis experience when they understood I'm mortal and I'm, I'm full of faults and failures and I need a new direction. I need a new reality, <laughs> praise the Lord. And so we think about the, the veil, Jesus Christ himself. Now he is the only veil uh, through Christ. We can enter in through Christ into the throne room of heaven, not just to a, a, a room in a tabernacle, but into the throne room in heaven where scripture tells us he's there now as our advocate. He's there now to, to talk to the Father on behalf of us and, and to send the Holy Spirit back and forth with answers for us. We, you and I, our new reality became on this day that we can enter into the throne room of heaven in the name of Jesus. Now that same scripture told you that there was a, 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 a priest. It was the high priest of God, if you want to do the research, that his name was Melchizedek. And, and Melchizedek was known as the king of Salem, the king of righteousness, the king of peace. And, and scripture tells you he had no father, he had no mother, he had no descent. And, and, and several times it speaks to that Jesus was a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Some would say Jesus is Melchizedek. I, I would all but say that. But I can say for certain it is either a high priest of heaven and or it is Christ. Because the scriptures will bear it out. Study the word Melchizedek. You will be very, very pleased. It's a subject all of its own. But Melchizedek, we now have a high priest in heaven after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, we have a high priest. We have the Lord Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father. And in his name, we can enter heaven. That's the new reality bought on this day. Just a few things that I want to mention to you were different on Easter than they were the day before. Uh, first of all, Jesus is a little different now. Uh, you remember we've, we've, we've seen him transfigured once uh, and, and became bright when his, when his God state outshined his human state. <laughs> and many times when people saw him like Daniel or John the Revelator, they would see him in his glory. Uh, when his eyes were like fire, his feet like brass, a, a, a white garment, a golden girdle, a, the, the sword coming out of his mouth, um, you know, all, all that countenance that shined about him. But we know he's different now. Mary didn't, Mary Magdalene didn't know him and thought he was the gardener. But once she spoke to him, he knew, she knew it was him. And she wanted to touch him and he said, no, don't, 
don't touch me yet. I've not yet ascended to my father. So later, she he allows people to touch him. We know that that not only is he different with Mary, but he's different with the people on the road to Emmaus uh, because they don't know who they're walking and talking with. And as they go from Jerusalem to Emmaus and have that talk to two people, to the disciples and Jesus, they are, are he's asking them about what went on as though he didn't know. And they are like, well, can't you, you know, don't you understand what went on today? You know, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And, and then there's reports this morning from the women and from the disciples that he is risen. And uh, the whole country is talking about this, uh, about Jesus of Nazareth. And then they finally get to where they're going, and they say to Jesus, why don't you come in with us? It's late. Jesus goes in with them, and they offer him something to eat, and he offers thanks, and all of a sudden they know who he is, and he's gone. <laughs> and not only is he God, but then they get to talking and they say, didn't our hearts burn within us? Didn't our hearts burn within us when we were talking to him? We should have known who we were talking to. Our hearts burned within us. And they went back to Jerusalem to tell the story. In Jerusalem, they, uh, 10 of the disciples, uh, there's a whole story about Judas. Uh, Thomas is with the 11. And at, at this time, Jesus just appeared. And after conversation and breathing on the Holy Ghost and speaking of peace, um, he also eats with them. So this glorified body can eat. But he, he obviously has a body that can do a lot of things that it couldn't do before. And scripture says, we don't know what we'll be like, but we know we'll be like him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Judas... That's all changed. Uh, Judas didn't find, of course, the satisfaction that he thought he would find in selling Jesus. The 30 pieces of silver finally became something he wanted rid of. He took it back and threw it down. And they wouldn't accept it back for the treasury because it was blood money. So they bought a, a field to bury people in by Potter's field. And... Um, Judas went out and hanged himself and evidently hit something and tore his body open and his bowels burst out, burst out. Um, Judas didn't end up well and, and his seat is to be filled. We know that things are different too because Satan now knows. Oh, well, Satan's always known he was number two. He's always known that. But Satan knows that he knows that he knows that he knows that he knows that the keys of death and hell are no longer hanging on his wall or in hell or in death or in any part of his dark kingdom, but that Christ went there and defeated what he had caused in Eden and took the keys of death and the keys of hell and said anybody that wants to enter into the throne room through my name now has access and they can repent and convert and be made right and they can be citizens that will never die. Oh, they might go through that and either that death of the body or the change in the rapture, but they will never die. They will, never, they will never be out of my presence. They will never be in hell. They will never be in that second death that kicked into the lake of fire at the end. Satan, you're done. You can rage. You can rant. You can be the prince of the power of the air. You can use every force you've got at your hand until the event that finally calls you to judgment. But you are a lame duck. You will not win anything. Satan knows my time is short. That's now clear. The disciples, I wrote a few things about the disciples. The disciples are, are now know the assignment is theirs. You remember the Great Commission? All power is given to me in heaven and earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. That's going to be Jesus' last command to them. He's going to turn this thing over to them. They will need to head up his church. They are going to need to wait on the power. 50 days from his crucifixion, from his coming up, there's going to be another time of the Holy Ghost coming down. And Acts 1.8 tells them, you need to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit uh, when it descends and it's going to make you witnesses. Uh, and you're going to start here at Jerusalem. You're going to go to Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost part of the world and be my witnesses. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and, and they are now going to be responsible for the setup. Uh, their headquarters there in Jerusalem, they are going to need to send people out and uh, make sure the doctrine is what Jesus taught. Make sure it's absolutely truth. Um, they are going to be called upon uh, in situations where there's doubts to set the doctrine in order. It's going to be their watch. They're going to have to grow up to the duties. They're going to have to grow up to the duties. It reminds me, I can't say that without thinking, that uh, early in my attempting ministry about the fourth year um, my mentors started dying and one of the mentors said to me uh, not too long before he passed you're going to have to uh, get ready to operate without all this umbrella of people over you that are taking the hits and and are, are guiding things uh, we have to go home our time is almost done and it'll be your watch. And you will be responsible to hold the doctrine. You will be responsible to speak the truth. You will be responsible on your watch to keep things the way the Lord left it. It's a new day. It's a new reality. Jesus is not going to be with them long. Jesus has done what he was supposed to do. He's defeated death. He's defeated hell. He's defeated the devil. All enemies have been slain. And he will return to the Father. And we know now for some 2,000 years, they will need a church that can last on the foundation for at least that long. We know that, don't we? They have to be sure the church is on the cornerstone and on the disciple and on the teaching of the Old Testament. Praise the Lord. Um, they, have to, um, they have to face Satan's death attempts. Satan is always there to try to kill, to steal, to destroy. Uh, Satan is a liar and the father of it. Uh, they had to write off the bat, so to speak, had to be ready uh, to, uh, to take the attacks upon them. Um, Satan will move Herod to kill Peter, I'm sorry, to kill James and to try to kill Peter. The church will pray and Peter will be obedient and he's the rock um, that Christ called him the rock. And Peter was the one that he asked about, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood didn't tell you this, but my father in heaven told you that. And upon that rock, I'm going to build a church. Peter, I am going to heaven. And the Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit will send the Spirit down to speak to people. And that Spirit will reveal to them that I am the Christ. They will, they will be questioning in their mind, in their heart, in their soul. And there will be things happen like with Pilate this morning. There will be things happen in their life uh, that says uh, you need to be thinking about Christ uh, just like this crisis uh, now with the virus. It, it, it should have caused you to think this is a pestilence worldwide. Uh, this could be one of the end time signs. Where do I stand in the kingdom of Christ? How am I? Where do I stand? 
How am I on Bible prophecy? How am I on my sins have been forgiven? How am I about that I've I'm doing my first works. I've been baptized. I've become a Christian. I've, I've entered a church. I, I've become a member. I'm starting to study the Bible. I'm becoming a prayer warrior. I, I'm living by the principles of Christ as the Holy Spirit teaches me. I'm going to be a soldier for the cross. I'm going to be ready when my time comes. You see, this is a new reality for all of the church of Jesus Christ on the Sunday morning when he has now defeated death. And then 50 days from now, he's going to rise. and Well, he's going to go away after 40. And then the Holy Spirit's going to come on the 50th. Thank you, Lord, for correcting me. He's going to go away. And then the Holy Spirit is going to come. And the church is going to be settled into the hands of the disciples. They're going to be in the upper room waiting for the Holy Ghost to descend when um, they, they see we've got to fill Judas's office. And, and they go about having that first ordination service. Uh, they pray and they cast lots to see who the Holy Spirit has chosen. And then later, there's a problem with the widows and um, they they are led by the Spirit to bring in some deacons and ordain some deacons, and they ordain seven deacons, and Satan kills the most powerful of them, Stephen. They have a, a, a long history from there to here of how the devil has fought the church. But the true Christian has to see that the new reality, the new reality after the resurrection after the ascension, after the Holy Spirit, is to be the church, a responsible church, to have people called as ministers, elders, deacons, singers, musicians, Sunday school teachers, maintenance people, uh, evangelistic people, people to work with youth, people to work with all ages, I couldn't even begin to tell you the jobs that the Lord has in his church. You and me today are new reality. Our new reality is we cannot deny we have faced a worldwide event. How are we going to be the church on the other side of this? We managed to become the church during it, didn't we? When we, I remember how, how, how sad, and I remember that it really, it really, so to speak, chewed on many of us who had to close the doors. The ones who had to actually say, this is what we've been asked to do by our, our officers, our leaders of the land. They've asked us to close the doors. And there's scriptures that says we're to be obedient to those uh, that are our leaders. And yet everything within us said, don't close the church. Uh, there, there was a, a mourning, M-O-U-R-N. We mourned closing the church. There was fear uh, of, will anybody pay their tithes? What will happen to the bills during this time? Uh, there was this fear uh, of, will they be true to the Lord in in serving him while they're home all this time? Will they be true, those who have just started coming to church or those who have just get, gotten saved, uh, those who are the weakest, what will happen to them? <laughs> the Lord made a way, didn't he? He got us out here, moving us around virtually to be the church of Jesus Christ. On the other side of this, Jesus changed the world and the disciples had to settle with them into the new reality. How will you make your new reality right now count for you, your family, your neighbors, your friends, and for the kingdom of Jesus Christ? I leave you with that question.